This month, New Mexico in Focus has been looking at gun ownership. In light of recent events, we wanted to examine mental illness and how it relates to gun violence. Although mental illness is often blamed after mass shootings, people who are dealing with psychological problems are actually more likely to use a gun to commit suicide. And our correspondent Gwyneth Dolan sat down this week with local experts in law enforcement and health care who are trying to improve reactions between police and people who are mentally ill. My guests today are Stephen Marshall, who's the director of the New Mexico Law Enforcement Training Academy. Dr. Dan Duhigg is a psychiatrist with UNM Hospital. He serves on the Mental Health Response Advisory Committee. And Rachel O'Connor is the head of the Community Services Department at Santa Fe County. Thank you all for being with us today. Thank you. Thanks. Dan, I want to talk to you first. When we have situations like this shooting in Orlando or the one that happened in Germany this week, uh, the motives are often very complicated, really, but people often say, this person must have been crazy to do this thing. And then people say, well, we need better access to mental health care, or, and we need uh, to change our laws about who has access to guns. Which of these is it? So it's a great question. Um, and it's a natural response because people want to explain the unexplainable, but not everybody who engages in a mass shooting or who kills other people necessarily have mental illness. Some people are just angry, some people just want to cause pain and suffering or punishment for others and aren't mentally ill necessarily. Um, but the second part of what you say is true. We do need more mental health services. We need treatment for people who have actual mental health uh, problems or mental illness. Um, and we do need a change in some of our laws. Um, for instance, we need changes in state laws that allow law enforcement to take guns away from people who have demonstrated violence or who a loved one or community member suspects of being violent uh, or that they're afraid that they will be violent. Um, and so uh, our law enforcement in the state now doesn't have actually the capability to take weapons away in that case. And that requires a change in state law. Stephen, you know, when we're talking about mental illness and gun violence, as uh, Dan has said, mental illness isn't actually a very good predictor of who is going to commit a, a terribly violent act. Uh, they say that other behaviors uh, like previous arrests for assault or domestic violence or multiple convictions for DWI, things like that, are better predictors. Um, when you're profiling someone, when you're looking at someone, you were in the FBI for 20 years, when you're looking at someone, is mental illness one of those factors or what do you value more than that when you're trying to figure out if someone is going to do a really bad thing? I think certainly more than mental illness you want to look at actions. You know, prior behavior is no guarantee of future behavior, but it's, uh, the mental illness, as Dan was saying, is, is a very small part of it. There's also issues such as what they've engaged in in the past. The problem is, and when you try to talk about laws to address this, the problem is people look at specific examples and say, but it wouldn't have prevented this case. And that's very true. There was no history of serious mental illness shown in, in most of the shooters that we've dealt with uh, in the last few years, whether they're claiming to be motivated by terrorism or something else. But we often do see this pattern, Rachel, of these multiple interactions with law enforcement before a big eruption of violence. And in Santa Fe County, you have created a mobile crisis response team that helps police respond to calls where there is some sort of mental uh, crisis, mental health crisis going on. What is the problem in Santa Fe County that you are trying to address with this mobile team? I think, Gwen, in 2014, we really looked at what was happening in Santa Fe County as well as the larger state of New Mexico and the country and saw that the issue of the intersection between mental health and law enforcement uh, was creating a situation that needed to be de-escalated. And so as a result of our health action plan, we funded a mobile crisis team, and they're really there to protect law enforcement as well as someone in crisis in avoiding having a situation escalate. Um, and I think there are a number of things that we're trying to prevent. Ultimately, we're trying to prevent violence in our community. We're trying to prevent suicide. We're trying to prevent um, incarceration as well for those people who really need mental health services rather than law enforcement. Now, you came to this position from a background in preventing injuries. 
what is it that you think that are, that are the most important things we can do to prevent gun violence related injuries in Santa Fe County or in New Mexico? You know, I think the mobile crisis team is one, is one thing that, that's happening uh, across the country in terms of an intervention or strategy that works. I think, um, as some of my colleagues have talked about today, looking at what the laws say, looking at access to guns, looking at increasing mental health services, a variety of factors really need to be taken into account. And some of those are simple things, uh, like gun locks and how we store weapons and, and those kinds of things. But I, I really think it's a combination of things that need to come forward. Now, Rachel mentioned suicide, Dan, and I want to come back to you on this because New Mexico has one of the highest suicide rates in the nation. It is the second leading cause of death for young people in New Mexico. We have been very fortunate here that we have not seen a terrorist attack or a mass shooting on the scale that we have seen in other places recently. Is suicide the most important gun violence related issue that we should be looking at? It is, and this is the untold story about guns. Most of the conversations that we're having about guns and gun violence are about mass shootings or about uh, crimes and homicides. And yet the largest number of gun-related deaths are suicide. In New Mexico, it's about 68% of gun-related deaths are suicide. Nationally, it's about 62%. So this is the majority of gun-related deaths. Um, and yet that's not the conversation that we're having. Why, why is this true about suicide? Why, why is this the, such a big problem? Well, it's a problem essentially because guns are so effective at completing a suicide. So there are many more suicide attempts that are not complete, that do not result in death. Um, than those that do result in death. Are we talking about people who take pills or try to hang themselves, other things like that? Exactly, exactly. And so some of those do result in death, but many of them do not. Although there's a disproportionate completion rate or result in death when a gun is involved. And essentially, you know, the way I think about it is that it's just so easy to do so much damage, right? You move that trigger just a few millimeters and you have an amazingly destructive force. So when a gun is used in a suicide attempt, it is more likely to result in death than any other uh, attempt. And I think another thing in that regard that we have to look at is with a number of these active shooter situations, they seem to be simply extended suicides of people who have had what they consider to be meaningless lives and they want to go out in a blaze of glory and be remembered. I think the most recent one in Orlando, there's a very good argument to be made that this was somebody who was full of self-loathing for whatever tendencies he may have had and was very self-destructive. We see that with a lot of the active shooters. They take themselves out as soon as law enforcement responds, as soon as they see someone come through the door. And it seems very obvious that was their plan in the beginning, was they wanted to end their own life, but they wanted to do it in a spectacular fashion so they would be remembered. I think also that suicide can tend to be really impulsive. And so that makes a really dangerous combination with a gun. If you have easy access to a gun, you can perform something uh, relatively quickly that can be very deadly. Particularly if you're intoxicated, which yes. is one of the huge risks uh, when it comes to suicide as a whole, but specifically suicide with a gun. If you're either intoxicated with alcohol or other illicit substances, things that didn't make sense to you before might all of a sudden make sense, or you might impulsively do something, you might not even realize that it has lethal potential, um, but you act on a whim and unfortunately there are these dire and lethal consequences. So we've talked about, you know, uh, alcohol being an issue uh, on this show previously. We've talked about domestic violence. Um, we talked about a history of violent activity. And you mentioned, Stephen, the Orlando shooter. There had been, people had reported him to the right. FBI. Uh, people had complained that he was saying creepy things at work. Uh, he had abused his wife. There are laws in several other states, Connecticut, Indiana, California, that allow law enforcement officers to take guns away from people who are uh, convicted of, or accused of domestic violence or they're in a crisis situation, they've been adjudicated mentally ill or they're in a mental health crisis. As a tool for law enforcement, we don't have this in New Mexico. Would that be helpful? Would it make a significant difference in preventing gun violence, whether it's suicide or intimate partner violence or something else? I think that'd be very difficult to answer uh, for a variety of reasons, one of which is, as we said, some of these cases just pop up. Uh, the, the Orlando shooter did have a history of domestic violence. 
the world's full of people with histories of domestic violence, histories of substance abuse who never go any further, just like there's numerous mentally ill people that are not dangerous. To predict future behavior with that kind of certainty brings up all sorts of constitutional issues when it comes to due process rights. People have a right to due process, they have a, a right to equal protection. If we start prejudging them based on conduct that does not necessarily guarantee future actions, then we end up in all sorts of constitutional issues. So it's a very complicated situation to get into. Uh, again, the federal law already prohibits mentally ill people from acquiring weapons, uh, does not seem terribly effective. Well, there we are, don't have legislation in New Mexico that would implement that here. Right, there, but there is uh, the opportunity and what we have seen are for negotiated uh, release of weapons, such as as a condition of a bond or a condition of a restraining order, that weapons be re uh, removed from the home. So th there are some provisions out there like that. I'm just not sure it will solve enough of our problems. Well, if you were the king of this country, or the benevolent dictator, right, the supreme ruler of America, and you could put a dent in this problem, you could solve a big chunk of the gun violence problem that we have, what would you do if you, if you didn't have to deal with Congress and you didn't have to deal with the dang Constitution? <laughs> what would you do? I don't know. If, if, I, if I had that kind of power, I'd be in a different, or that kind of knowledge, I'd be in a different position. I think what we have to do is we have to learn from history. We have to learn how to respond. But again, predicting behavior is always going to be almost impossible. That's why when we look at attacks like in Orlando, we look at it more as an active shooter situation. We have completely changed our response to active shooters since Columbine in 1999. Uh, we have to react quickly. We've learned that most shooters in that situation will do them, uh, will commit suicide when confronted with law enforcement. So we try to make that confrontation as quickly as possible. That's my area. We, we respond. Uh, predicting what they're going to do is, is somebody else's category. Rachel, your area is preventing these That's accidents. correct. So if you had that magic wand, benevolent dictator, what would you do? You know, I think some of the things that we've all talked about here are important. I think uh, having an interface between mental health and law enforcement is extremely important. Um, it's extremely important, as he just stated, that when confronted with law enforcement, you often escalate the problem. And there's someone there to serve as protection for law enforcement as well as protection for the individual. But I think it has to be a combination of things. I think there are laws that could be changed in terms of uh, this issue. I think that certainly some of the easy safety steps with regard to guns um, and I think uh, on the federal level uh, there's a variety of steps that should be taken as well. Dan, we just have a minute. What would you do with your wand? Uh, well, I don't think you need a wand and I don't think you need to throw out the Constitution. So. Uh, California has implemented this, and it's really in line with the Constitution, uh, where what you do is, is you take people's access to guns away temporarily, right? And it's based on, on known risks. So, for instance, if you have um, uh, a, uh, if, if you're in a domestic violence situation, if you have repeated DWI arrests, if you have a history of violent misdemeanor charges, you might get your access to guns taken away for up to five years, and you have the ability to petition to get that access back after a year, and a psychiatrist or a psychologist evaluates you, and then the judge makes that determination. So it's, it's not contrary to the Constitution, it's not permanent removal of access, but it's removal just long enough to hopefully delay any um, kind of repeat of violent uh, activity. I want to thank you all for being here with us today and talking about this thorny issue. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.